Welcome everyone. This is now our 18th Zoom panel in as many months. From our registration list, we are continuing to attract viewers from abroad with over a dozen countries represented from Japan to Australia, Russia to Germany, France and Spain, Ireland and Scotland and Britain to Canada. And in this country, we have uh, viewers from coast to coast and over 30 museum professionals and academicians. And of course, welcome a majority of collectors, arguably all fans of the amazing work of Kawase Shinobu. But I wanna tell you about one amazing event that actually transpired today in the area of contemporary clay. And while there were no works by Kawase Sensei in the collection of John Driscoll that sold in a London auction at Phillips today, it was unquestionably a red letter day for the world of the contemporary clay market with 163 lots selling for well over 6.5 million pounds. And a wonderful work by our friend Koike Shoko from the same body of work as the one in the Metropolitan Museum from Mary Burke's collection, and similar to one in the Minneapolis Institute of Art, sold for over $65,000. So a, a remarkable occasion and clearly, uh, contemporary clay is on the map uh, around the globe. Tonight, with over 400 screens booked, we can surely agree that this is a testament to the creativity, technical genius, and fame of the celebrated artist Kawase Shinobu. So let me get things started off with a bit of background about my very long-standing relationship with this quite gifted master. The story started in 1979 when I met the woman who is work with us tonight, uh, Kusaka Chieko of Shogodo, Tokyo, a leading dealer in Chinese antiquities. And I met her in Paris at an auction when my husband and I were living there in the uh, late 1970s. Uh, when uh, I met her, we shared clearly a passion for things Japanese and we became instant friends. In 1983, uh, I attended the Japan Ceramics Today show organized by Louise Court of the collection of Kikuchi Tomo at the Smithsonian. And at that time, I completely fell in love of my favorite piece of the hundreds of pieces that were in that show with a work resembling this uh, inkstone that you see on the top corner. So I said to Chieko when I was coming to Japan in 1984 that I had to meet the man who made that. And fortunately, Kawase Sensei was one of her uh, clients and dear friends. And in, but in order to meet Kawase, like everything in Japan, you needed more than one connection. So first I had to meet Kikuchi Tomo and through her generosity and patronage, uh, we together went to visit Kawase Sensei in 1984, and that was the start. He was the first clay artist I knew personally, and our relationship literally is um, working on 40 years at this point. And as he has grown as an artist, I think he has helped me to develop as a dealer. Um, the arduous road to becoming his dealer versus just buying a piece here and there was not easy. Uh, at that point in time, he, uh, Kawase had only two dealers with whom he worked on an annual basis, which were the great, of course, Kandori Gallery, which was owned by Kikuchi Tomo, and the still wonderful dealer um, of antique Asian art, Kochukyo, in Tokyo. So I would go visit him, pick out works, and then I would have to buy it through one of those two uh, dealers for almost 10 years. So I paid my, my dues, if you will. And through the wonderful dealer, Urigami Mitsuru, who's standing to the left of Kwase Sensei in the lower picture, um, who is also a great dealer in Chinese antiquities in Tokyo. He facilitated the establishment of my ability to be his international representative. So I'm very grateful to all of these wonderful Japanese friends who have allowed us 
to get to the point in 2005 to do the first show for him outside of Japan, as you see on the brochure to your right. My next show for him was in 2007, I'm sorry, 2009, when I had just opened my gallery a year and a half before, and we did the show that you see in the lower left-hand corner called Flowering Wave of Celadon. And you can see through, through my shelf there, um, uh, one, of the one of the major players in the Kochukyo establishment. And at, at the top, you see um, Sensei in his studio when he was lecturing uh, to a group of very avid Kawase Shinobu fans when we visited his place in Oiso in 2011. Uh, everyone on that tour already owned a countless numbers of his pieces because owning works by this man is a, a, a sh sure addiction, as you will hear. Um, but nevertheless, everyone um, plunged ahead and bought multiple pieces for a very successful tour. And this uh, this led to 2014, our next show and our most recent show that you see at the top of the screen. And um, Sensei with his wonderful wife Keiko standing there before some of the works. Um, this show in 2014 was the first time he introduced what we what he has labeled Suiji. Um, or he nicknamed Kingfisher, Kawasemi Lays, and you see the bowl in the lower, um, in the center of the screen at the bottom, where he is able to integrate color for the first time into his normally uh, monochromatic um, celadon blue tonality. Uh, this was followed by um, the retrospective that he had in 2018 at the Musée Tomo. Uh, which was no mean feat. And the way the Tomo Museum set this show up, and for those of you who've been there, there's sort of two major rooms. And the room, this shot that we're looking at is of his classical work that is most clearly aligned to things Chinese. And as you progress through the show on the other side of that archway, you see his more sculptural work. And um, that was a major achievement with a beautiful publication put together by, in the last slide, the person who I forgot to mention was Mari Hanazoto, who was the then curator um, there under Madame Kukuchi, um, who arranged this show. And this was followed uh, the next year in 2019 with my launch of the Allure book, the Allure of Japanese Contemporary Ceramics where I was asked to write a book for the Japanese market on just basically what the hell do Americans get about contemporary Japanese clay that the Japanese don't get. And we had a panel discussion that la was launched at Sataya at Ginza 6, a very glamorous um, uh, main location for the major, major publisher of Japan. And I invited, um, three artists who had to speak, who were my focus of the new direction in non-functional ceramics. So you see Fujikasa Satoko on what you see is on my left, uh, Kondo Takahiro behind her, and to the right of Kawase Sensei, you see Akiyama Sensei. I asked Kawase san to be there with us because I felt so strongly that while his work isn't cutting edge in the sense of sculptural non-functional work. His command of his media is so transcendent and that his work says it all about Japan's understanding of technique and tradition that I wanted his voice to be part of this panel discussion. So that brings you up to the present, except for the show that we have now, which uh, some of you may get to see. We've had a few visitors, New York is open. I welcome you all, uh, but we do have a virtual tour that you can find on our website with a video and you can pretend that you're actually in the show. So now I want to open the discussion to our esteemed panelists and uh, the panelists who will be speaking to us first is Dr. Bob Mowry. Um, I'm sure he's known to the vast majority of our uh, listeners tonight. He is the Alan J. Dworsky Curator of Chinese Art Emeritus at Harvard Art Museums. He has done considerable work with also with Korean art, 
an interest that was sparked when he was working for the US Peace Corps as a volunteer in Korea in the 1960s. Following graduate work at the University of Kansas, uh, and that followed by two years as a curatorial assistant and translator at the National Palace Museum in Taipei in 1977, Bob then became an assistant curator at Harvard's Fogg Art Museum. He went on to serve as the founding curator of the Mr. and Mrs. John D. Rockefeller III collection at Asia Society. And in 2000, he returned to Boston as the newly endowed Dworsky Chair, a position that he held until his retirement. Uh, Bob now serves as a senior consultant in Chinese and Korean art at Christie's in New York. So my first question is going to go to Bob. And um, Bob, my question to you, first question is Celadon is inextricably linked to the Song Dynasty, which produced some of the best known examples worldwide. Many, many of you here may be surprised to learn, however, that Celadon is not one particular green blue color or special glaze, but that the term referred to a multiplicity during even at the time of the Song Dynasty. Can you explain for all of us and clarify the various types of celadon glazes that were the hallmark of that era? Bob? Thank you, Joan. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you and with all from around the world who have joined this program. Uh, and it's an honor to serve as a panelist. So thank you very much. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, the Song Dynasty in China, that is basically the 11th, 12th, and uh, 13th centuries, uh, the Song Dynasty is renowned for the Celadon wares that it produced. Uh, the Celadon wares uh, were pioneered and evolved in China, coming to fruition in the Song Dynasty. But Korea and Japan as well also produced Celadon wares. So what is Celadon ware? What does the term mean? Well, it's a little bit confusing, uh, precisely because people use the term Celadon in different ways often to mean different things. At the most basic level, and we could say there are two basic meanings to the term Celadon. The first meaning, which would be the most basic, simply refers to the color, as you see here. Uh, next slide, please. Um, a pale bluish green uh, color. Next, please. Um, uh, it's a, it's a, it can be transparent or it can be uh, opaque, but a pale bluish green color, sometimes grayish blue, that's typically applied over a light gray stoneware body. Uh, it can be put over porcelain as we often see in Japan, but in China and Korea, it's usually over stoneware. The stoneware is opaque, which means that what we see in looking at a, a, a celadon glaze is the light reflected from the glaze but the light passing through the glaze and reflected back through the glaze from the underlying stoneware body. It's a little bit different of, with porcelain because a little more of the light actually goes into the porcelain rather than being reflected back. Now, the characteristic bluish green color results from a small percentage of iron oxide in the glaze. And with that present in an otherwise clear glaze, and if the piece is fired in a reducing atmosphere, which we will get to a little bit later, uh, uh, a beautiful bluish green piece can come out of the kiln. Now, where does the term come from? Just to, to talk about some very basic things. Uh, the word Celadon came into English from French. It first appeared in French in the 17th century as the name of the shepherd, Celadon, uh, in the pastoral romance novel, La Stray by Honoré d'Orfey. Uh, and because Celadon wore sage green ribbons, his name became associated with that color. So in French and English, it's always referred to the color, uh, to a bluish green or sage green color. Next, please. Uh, the Chinese term for Celadon is Qing Si, uh, the same two characters used in Korean and Japanese, pronounced Cheng Jia in Korean and Seiji in Japanese. In, in, uh, in uh, East Asian languages, uh, the Qing, Cheng, Se, whichever language you want to pronounce it in, basically refers to bluish green. And this is important because some people have translated Celadon as green. It doesn't mean green. 
uh, in fact, the Chinese and Koreans and Japanese have a different word for green. It distinctly means bluish green. And then the second character in Chinese refers to the underlying high fired ceramic body, which the glaze coats. Next, please. Now, this probably comes as a shock, a nice pane of glass. But my point here is to say that a glaze is basically a glass coating on a ceramic piece. So glazes and glass are not only related uh, technically and in terms of their material, but even etymologically. So that glaze, glass, they come from the same uh, 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 linguistic roots. Now, when we see a pane of window glass, we look through the window, it seems that there is no color. But you all know that if you look at a piece of broken glass, look at a shard, you look at it from the edge, just as you see here, there is this pale bluish green color. This comes from about a quarter to a half percent of iron in the glaze. The same thing that's giving the color in the, in the pane of glass is what's giving the color to the celadon glaze. If we add, take it up to maybe one, one and a half percent, you get the color of a Coke bottle. For those of you old enough to remember a Coke bottle instead of a, a can of Coca-Cola. But this establishes the relationship between a glaze and glass and shows that even in the glass, in some ways it's a form of celadon. Next, please. Now, uh, when you take it, the amount of iron in the glaze to two or three percent, uh, and then you fire the piece in a reducing atmosphere, which means that the, the firing chamber in the kiln is kept uh, without fresh air and without oxygen. It will <clears throat> uh, 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 fire a beautiful uh, bluish green, sometimes more blue, sometimes more a uh, little bit more green as we see here. Next, please. And then, uh, this is not a celadon, but it's just to show that if you add a little more iron and take it from the 3%, uh, more or less, it's in a celadon glaze, to five to six percent, you get what is essentially a black glaze. If you look very carefully at the mouth of this piece, you'll see it's not a truly black glaze. It is a very dark brown glaze. We might call it a black coffee brown uh, glaze, which looks black in reflected light, but in transmitted light, uh, it's actually very dark brown. And of course, I'm referring to the basic glaze color. Uh, it results because the glaze is saturated uh, with iron oxide, which means that additional iron oxide can be placed on the surface in these spots or mottles that you see here uh, for decorative effect. And because the glaze is already saturated with iron oxide, uh, the, uh, the models stay on the surface and don't sink into the glaze, which means that, uh, that the color of window glass, the color of celadon, and the color of a black glaze like this, we might even say they're siblings. It's not a radically different formula. It's just the amount of iron oxide in the glaze. Next, please. Uh, now, the celadon glaze, as we see here, can be uh, translucent, even opaque, or, next slide, it can be clear and transparent, as we see here. Those pieces with a translucent or opaque glaze uh, typically rely on the tautness of form of the vessel and the beauty of the glaze for their aesthetic appeal. Those pieces with a clear and transparent glaze may also uh, be undecorated and rely on the, the vessel's form and the beauty of the glaze for aesthetic appeal. But many of them, because the glaze is transparent, may have decoration incised, carved, or molded underneath the glaze that is created before the glaze was applied, and then looking like this when it comes out of the kiln. Next, please. Now, this is also a celadon glaze. We often don't refer to it as a celadon wear, but it fits the technical definition. That is, it's a high-fired glaze uh, with about 2%, uh, 1.5 to 2% iron oxide in the glaze, but it's on porcelain. This is called Qingbai ware. It's produced at the kilns of Jingdezhen in Jiangxi province, uh, the same kilns that will produce the famous blue and white ware that we associate with Yuan, Ming, and Qing. Uh, dynasties when speaking of Chinese uh, blue and white ware. So now this is very pale blue uh, instead of a pale bluish green, but it's still within the celadon family from a technical point of view. Next, please. And then talking about the wide range of celadon wares, uh, this wouldn't qualify for the definition of pale bluish green, 
but it qualifies from the technical point of view because the basic glaze is colored with about two, two and a half percent of iron oxide. But to that glaze, the potters have added either bamboo ash or potash. And the addition of the ash or potash causes the glaze to turn this beautiful pale blue, often termed a robin's egg uh, blue. Uh, but if you left the potash or bamboo ash out, it would be a bluish green celadon glaze. But with that addition, it turns blue. Sometimes, I didn't bring a slide, but sometimes the potters might add a splash of, of uh, copper or copper upside to the surface of the glaze before firing, which will result in a nice purple splash. Uh, and I think uh, uh, Kawase Sensei has probably taken inspiration from some of these types of, of Chinese uh, Celadon and Celadon family of wares from the Song Dynasty. So I hope that gives some idea of, of the different meanings of Celadon and the, the, the wide array of pieces that can fall within, within, fall under that umbrella. Thank you, Bob. That was an amazingly complex problem that's been articulated so clearly that we should all be able to fully understand the colors of Celadon and their chemical constituents. So thank you, that was great. My next question is for uh, Kawase Sensei. Um, I will ask the question in English and my wonderful friend Cheko Kusaka will be assisting him with that and then with the translation for you. Uh, sensei, before the advent of the internet and digital photography, I know you had to travel around the world to, in order to study firsthand the best of Chinese antique celadon work. Through the decades of study and experimentation, you have interpreted well-known historical precedents of celadon from the Song Dynasty and created a distinctive artistic style that has brought celadon into the 21st century. Can you tell us what are some of the aspects of Song Dynasty Celadon that you personally found so intriguing when you saw them in person? And how did you begin to break away from what you saw in museums and find your own artistic voice? Sensei. Hey, <coughs> あの、中国の流星王の墓間を死の功労をソフから学んだ時が、あの、が政治に入るきっかけでした。で、その の形の美しさに魅力を感じました。で、その南蘇海洋をもっとたくさん勉強したくなったので、それ勉強するには台北のあの国に呼吸博物院に行くのが一番いいということも感じまして、あの呼吸博物院に行く機会ができました。で、その
僕の理想としております。<笑>そんな中あの、その憧れる政治があのどうして生まれたのかなと思ったときに、この国葬時代の,あの作った人は、あの僧の焼き物屋さんって工人なので、その工人が何を見て、あのこれを作ったのかなということを想像いたしました。えー、あのー、この総時代の焼き物ですので、当然その投稿が見たのは総の前の時代のものですね。で前の時代と言いますと、まあ、同時代、あと陸朝時代です。それで、あのー、あさっきやりましたあの、あのー、陸朝の常備を見て、あのー、そのその陸長の時代の人はそういうのを作ったということを感じてでは陸長の人が何を見て作ったかなと思った時にもう一つ前の時代で、まあ、その漢,あの漢字がこれが今ちょっと陰時代ですけども、まあ、そういうものを,を見て作ったんじゃないかなと思ってであのー、もっと古いところになると次あのいいですかネクストにまああのーでそのこういうものを見ていたんじゃないかなというふうに思いました。So this now so you are looking one photo. It's black wine cup. Also this is n e o l i t h i c だんだんだんだんあの僕の場合古いものに関心を持つようになってでこの古いものを一番最初に何をその何をヒントにしたかなということを考えました。で、そうするとあの一番最初ですから、あの人間が作ったもの作ったものじゃないものですね。で、あ、そうだ人間作ってないものですので、自然の形じゃないかなということに気がつきました。そしてそのたまたまその自然にじゃないかなと思ったときに考えたときに。あのこの今を作るあの花、庭に今これ我が家に咲いてた花なんですけども、庭に咲いてるカラーの花を見て、この花の柔らかい線が、曲線が、あの粘土の加速性を表現し、なんか触ったら、へこみそうなふうに思いました。あ、そうです。これあの今のですね。今のですね。はい。今のですね。はい。ですね。はい。です Part of the flowers and sometimes it's from the leaves.、Oh, and also, this is, is the one strong impression is aurora. And also, fishes and the fish's mouth, mouth give me another inspiration. And also, those photos, it's、uh, my image. For the lotus flowers and the other photos are lotus D image. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're getting some sense of looking at all of these pictures,、um, how broadly you cast your net, how far you look a field beyond what the Chinese prototypes are to use the glaze as a basis for artistic expression. Um, combining with nature. 
Um, some of you who may have been to visit Sensei may know that he used to keep a, bet, a pet stingray in a, in a tank in his living room. And we used to watch the, the rays swim around. And, and as that fish moved, it was very easy to see how his beautiful flowing works were inspired by the elegance of the fish for quite some time. Um, so next, I would like to go back to Bob uh, before I turn to Susan to ask Bob, because we want to get our historic, historical precedents all in a row, if you will. And uh, Bob, um, as you previously mentioned, there is a tremendous range of coloration in Chinese celadons. Um, can you explain to us the role of actually the firing process in enabling uh, craftspeople, artisans, and artists today to create such a remarkable array of coloration? Yes, that's a very important topic. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the pieces that I showed before, the beautiful blue and green uh, celadon, uh, the Qing Bai piece with the pale blue glaze over a white porcelain body, and the Juneware bowl with the robin's egg blue glaze. Those were all intentional. Those are the colors the potters wanted. Those are the colors their clients uh, wanted. Now, what could go wrong, so to speak, so that things don't turn out exactly as they might have hoped? Uh, and right here, we should interject that one has to distinguish between traditional kilns and the types, of the kilns that were used for firing uh, the pieces that I showed you before uh, were basically sort of what would be called dragon kilns, that is a long uh, kiln sort of going up an incline. Uh, uh, and they were wood fired. Now, when you get something, a celadon piece like this, this is from the Yaozhou kilns, and uh, uh, Yaozhou was the old name of the, uh, of the place. It's about 75 miles north of Xi'an. Uh, you're all familiar with the life-sized uh, terracotta warriors from the uh, tomb of the first emperor of Qin. Has nothing to do with this, but that tomb and those warriors come from Xi'an. And so this came from about 75 miles north uh, of that particular area. The important thing here, and the reason this is more olive green than bluish green, uh, is because of firing conditions. The potters probably didn't want it to turn out this way. They probably wanted it to be bluish green. Um, it's still a beautiful piece, and uh, there was certainly a market for it in the Song Dynasty. But here we have to consider two things. Uh, first of all, we have to consider the fuel. Uh, where those beautiful bluish glazes were produced, they're produced using wood as fuel. Uh, the blue and white ware from Jing to Jun, for example, uh, is all fired with wood. Uh, the Qing Bai piece, pale blue glaze that I showed you on the porcelain body, that was using uh, wood as a fuel. Uh, and there, was a, there are abundant forests uh, in, uh, in central and southern China, uh, lots of rainfall. Uh, so the, the forests replaced themselves uh, as they cut the trees uh, to, to burn the wood as fuel for the kilns. The north is another matter. If you've traveled in North China, you know it can be very dry. And today there aren't so many trees. Uh, the Chinese were aware of coal which if you've read Marco Polo, you know he was so surprised when he traveled in China in the 14th century uh, that the Chinese were able to burn rocks, uh, which he didn't, he only later came to understand was coal. But the Chinese knew about coal long before that. And as the fuel source, that is trees uh, and wood for uh, fueling the kilns uh, sort of disappeared in Northern China, potters in the North, particularly by the Song Dynasty were turning to coal as their fuel. Uh, basically, they began the transition period is in the 10th century uh, for many of the northern kilns, uh, beginning to use coal and gradually shifting almost completely to coal, as that was the, the fuel that was most readily available to them. Now, it's very difficult to achieve reduction firing when you use coal. And that's what accounts for in a piece like this uh, for the olive hue to the glaze rather than the bluish green hue. Now, what is reduction firing? I've mentioned that several times. Well, there are basically two types of firing, oxidation firing and reduction firing. 
Oxidation firing, as you might guess, means that there is uh, fresh air, including oxygen, going into the kiln's firing chamber where the ceramics are actually placed when they're being fired. Uh, and it's the oxygen in that atmosphere, that very hot atmosphere, that's reacting with the chemicals in the glaze as it melts and causes it to turn uh, an olive or yellowish green instead of bluish green. Now reduction firing, which is necessary to get a bluish green celadon is just the opposite of reduction firing or a reducing atmosphere. What that term reducing or reduction means, it means you're reducing the amount of oxygen uh, in the firing chamber, simple as that. It means that the kiln has to be very uh, carefully controlled, uh, all possibilities for fresh air getting into the kiln completely closed so that it is the smoke uh, and, and, and warm air from the fire that is passing through the firing chamber. Now the smoke contains a great deal apart from combustion products and ash and soot and such, it contains uh, a great deal of carbon dioxide, but also a great deal of carbon monoxide. And it's the carbon monoxide that is necessary uh, for reduction firing, but also for producing the, the bluish green celadon glaze. The carbon monoxide, in the same way that it's lethal to us, it kills us because it pulls the oxygen out of our system. Not only does it deprive us of oxygen if we breathe it, it actually pulls oxygen out of our body. Now in the kiln, in the heat of the kiln during firing, the carbon monoxide passing through the firing chamber is doing the same thing. It's pulling the oxygen out of the, uh, of the glaze, meaning that a slightly different set of chemical reactions uh, is taking place. Uh, uh, the chemical reactions with oxygen doesn't produce a wildly different color, but if there's oxygen present, it will produce a yellowish or uh, olive hue, as you see here. If there's no oxygen present, and the glaze formula is the right one, uh, you'll get the, the, the cooler uh, bluish green uh, glaze. Next, please. That's the difference between these two. Uh, this one, if there had been even less uh, oxygen in the kiln, would have been even more bluish green. As it is, it's still more bluish green than the previous one. Uh, now, sometimes at the Yaojo kilns, when a piece turns out with a nice, uh, more or less bluish green glaze like this one, we can't know whether this is a firing where they happen to use fuel instead of coal, or even in a uh, kiln that's, that's uh, heated with uh, uh, a coal burning fire. Sometimes there are places in the kiln that are more advantageous for firing and getting the proper color. There are other places that are less advantageous. So in retrospect, we can't know. Uh, in all probability, it's just a matter of this was in the, exactly the right place uh, to have some re, uh, reduction firing when everything else in the kiln, and there might have been hundreds, even thousands of pieces in that firing. Uh, the rest probably didn't turn out as happily as this one did. Next, please. Now this is dingware. Uh, it's not a celadon per se. Uh, uh, it is a porcelainous stoneware, basically porcelain, and uh, uh, it uh, has a clear glaze. It's sort of an ivory hued glaze. Uh, and because it's a clear glaze, the pieces are usually embellished with incised and carved decoration. A little bit later, uh, perhaps with molded decoration, and it's usually floral decoration. Now, next slide, please. And this is a detail. When you move up close to it, not looking so much at the decoration, but you can see that it has a very warm feeling to it. Uh, it's an ivory hued glaze. Next, please. Now, this we've seen before. This has basically the same glaze formula. The ding kilns are loaded, located in the north, not the same area as Yaozhou, they're in a different province, but nonetheless they're in the north and by the 10th century the potters had switched from wood to coal. With the dingware, uh, the coal causes this type of celadon glaze that you see in this piece, instead of turning blue, to turn sort of an ivory color, which is warm and it's very pleasing. If you want a celadon glaze, like the olive one we saw, maybe it's not quite what they wanted, but with the dingware, uh, having the ivory hued glaze was just fine. With this piece, by contrast, this is what they wanted, uh, the, basically the same glaze formula, but fired with wood and a very well-controlled reducing atmosphere and comes out very happily as we see here. 
Next, please. Now, it's just to say that's all I will say. I just want to emphasize, as I mentioned in the beginning, that while we associate uh, celadon glazed wares and the whole range of celadon glazed wares with China, particularly during the Song Dynasty, but continuing into later periods as well, Korea also has a very strong tradition, uh, inherited, if you will, uh, from the Chinese, but uh, a very strong tradition of celadon ware, particularly during the Korea Dynasty in the 11th, 12th, and 13th centuries. Next, please. Another beautiful Korean piece, uh, probably from the 12th century. It's a brush rest for the scholar's desk. So the scholar can alternate between brushes of various sizes and textures uh, while doing a painting or uh, a work of calligraphy. Next, please. And while the Celadon tradition came late to Japan, not really until the 17th century, uh, the, the Japanese potters, particularly at the Nabashima kilns, also produced some very, very attractive celadon wares, often in new and exciting ways, uh, applying it over porcelain, as we see here, but sometimes used in combination, one area uh, with celadon glaze, other areas with just a clear colorless glaze. Uh, and then in the middle of this particular piece that depicts uh, a stack of dishes, if you will, uh, you have blue and white ware. Uh, which is uh, uh, the same porcelain uh, embellished with designs painted in underglazed cobalt blue. And then the same clear glaze that's over the lower right portion of the piece continuing uh, over the uh, cobalt embellished areas. And then the celadon glaze at the top. Next, please. And this is the last one I will show. But this type of piece is uh, rare. It comes from the same kiln, from the Namashima kiln, but occasionally, potters at the Nabashima kilns in the 17th and early 18th centuries will coat an entire porcelain piece uh, with a celadon glaze, which is the same glaze that you saw uh, in the upper part of the previous piece. And it's a very close relative of the celadon glazes on Korean pieces and of course on Chinese pieces uh, from the Song Dynasty. So there is a real uh, kinship uh, between all of these wares. At the same time, there are distinct uh, distinct national and cultural differences, uh, so that while they're allied, they're also uh, quite readily distinguishable based on style and, uh, and general appearance. That was marvelous, Bob. Thank you so much. Um, as the daughter of two organic chemists, um, I should have been listening more carefully as a child to all sorts of uh, explanations about organic chemistry and heating interactions. and. Uh, who would think that an art historian has to be so grounded in molecular chemistry to be able to decipher how a particular glaze uh, 600 years ago was created. And that was really illuminating and helpful. And quite honestly, I didn't know anything about the difference between using red pine and coal and how coal uh, made such an impact in the colors of glaze. So that was terrific. Good. Thank you. Um, I'm going to turn to our very patient speaker who's sitting there uh, waiting for us to move into the 21st century. Um, Susan Benningson, I actually know even longer than Cheko Kusaka and uh, Kawase Shinobu, as we are both from Stanford, Connecticut. And um, while we went to different school systems within the city, we were members of the same synagogue. So our two families know each other forever. Um, more importantly, Susan is an independent curator based in New York City. Her most recent exhibition, We the People, Xu Bing and Sun Xu, Respond to the Declaration of Independence, was part of the first and recent Asia Society Museum Triennale. From 2013 to 19, she served as a curator of Asian art at the Brooklyn Museum. Her projects during her tenure included the installation of the, the brand new galleries of Chinese and Korean art. Additionally, she has taught uh, Asian and Islamic art history at the City University of New York, Rutgers University, and Columbia University. She is a member of the collections and advisory committees of the Asia Society and has previously served on the board of the First Sackler Galleries at the Smithsonian. She has lectured uh, and published very widely on both contemporary and historical Asian art. Uh, Susan Reser Reser um, received her PhD from my alma mater uh, at, in Chinese art at Columbia University in Chinese art and archeology. span So I'm delighted to have Susan back with us for our second time 
um, on, a, on another panel. And so my first question to Susan is, when you were at the Brooklyn Museum, you helped to create the immensely popular and extremely long running exhibition in 2016 titled Infinite Blue. It ran for nearly three years. In that show, there were numerous exhibited Celadon works from many different cultures. How and why were these selections made and in what context were they presented so as to spark the conversations between the works across the regions and across many time periods? Susan? Hi, Joan. Um, thank you so much for including me as a panelist. And congratulations to you and to Kawasi Sensei for such an exquisite exhibition at your gallery. It's like a jewel box and I really encourage everybody to go see it. Um, the picture on the screen is actually from uh, Kawasi Sensei's visit to Brooklyn Museum Art Storage in 2014. Um, I was telling him before when we were talking just before the presentation today how lucky he was to come at that time because the gal permanent galleries were closed and so all the masterworks were in storage and so we encouraged a lot of people to come and really just hold them so on the left he's holding Brooklyn's uh, famous uh, fish jar um, dating from the Yuan dynasty from the 14th century and on the right you'll see my former colleague Joan Cummins and I with uh, sensei and his wife Keiko and uh, the ceramics on the tray in front of him are well, on the left there's a Longchuan ceramic and you can see it was re repaired in Japan by the gold on the handle and the middle one is a late Yuan possibly early Ming underglazed red uh, ceramic and but the one on the right is is one of the most famous pieces in the Brooklyn collection and it's a Korean it's a Goryeo dynasty uh, Celadon with, from the first half of the 12th century. So this visit was in September 2014. And uh, I just felt very lucky that he could come in and actually hold the ceramics. Next slide, please. Um, the exhibition Infinite Blue, which as Joan mentioned, ran for about three years. Um, it actually, I will tell you the very short form of the story, which was that our new director at that time uh, invited all the curators or rather instructed all the curators to come up with an exhibition that would include works from all the different departments from the museum and gave us six months to do it. <laughs> and so there were a number of different rotations of the works on paper, but because the Asian galleries were closed for renovation, um, we were able to show the ceramics for all three years of the exhibition. Uh, next slide, please. Um, you'll see in the front the fish jar, which is the one that Kawase Sensei was just holding a moment ago there in the exhibition. And in back of it, one of the things we tried to talk about was not only the symbolic meanings of the color blue and how that has evolved over time and in different cultures, but also how materials and technologies combine to tell different stories about global history and cultural value technological innovation and international trade and commerce. So we talked about things like lapis lazuli and cobalt and also blue pigments extracted from plants like indigo. In this, you can see the Chinese ceramic in the front and in the back, you can see blue and white ceramics from other countries. So we showed Chinese blue and white, we showed Japanese blue and white, but then we showed things in China and Japan made for the Southeast Asian market, made for the European market, and then later European ceramics that had been influenced by them. And you can see on the back wall, Islamic textiles and also some Western paintings. So it really incorporated um, all the different departments of the museum, Asian, Egyptian, Native American, African, European, as well as contemporary art, many different mediums. Next slide, please. So of course I had to show the Celadon case for, or one of the Celadon cases. And Brooklyn is very lucky to have two works uh, by Kawase Sensei. You can see on the, on the right side in the back is that gorgeous um, vase with the Celadon glaze from 1988 purchased with funds from the Mary Griggs Burke Foundation. Um, and on the far left, you can see some Celadons including um, there's, uh, guanware, you can see dingware, junware, but also you might not notice that, I guess it's third from the 
uh, third from the right from Coasses, that's Southeast Asian. So we also had Southeast Asian material in the same case. And we wanted to talk about the exchange of ideas and how different ideas you know, move from place to place. And obviously things on the left hand side of the case influence Koase san on, on the right side of the case. Next, um, next slide, please. Here's another view of infinite blue. And you can see um, in the case um, in the front, um, a fabulous work um, by Koase Sensei, graciously donated by the fabulous Joan Mervis, um, the incense burner in the shape of a lotus, which is just fabulous. And then on the right side of the same case, there's some Qinlong ceramics from China. Uh, next slide, please. And this is another side of the same case. And in the back, you can see works by the Korean American artist, Byron Kim on the wall and Art Deco glass in this case. So we really covered lots of different things. And there's a, this is another view of the incense burner. Next slide, please. And here's a, a detail of it. Um, I think it's important to note that though, I mean, Brooklyn has a fabulous collection of both uh, modern and contemporary Japanese ceramics. Um, but the plan has been to show this in the Buddhist art gallery. Um, as, as you may know, uh, a lotus is a symbol of rebirth in Buddhist paradise. And so this incense burner will not be in the Japanese galleries, but in the Buddhist galleries, where I think it will have a really, really strong presence. And hopefully someday soon the Jap Buddhist galleries will even be done. <laughs> Um, I think that's my last thank, slide. On thank you, Susan. Uh, that was a nice nostalgic look back at a show that I visited many, many times and uh, thoroughly enjoyed it, as did uh, a large pre-COVID population who returned again and again and again. It was a feast for the eyes. It was a great tour. And I wish I was there when you were there with Sensei in the back. Uh, storage rooms at Brooklyn, handling those things myself. I really miss that. Um, I should say there's a little chat that just popped up from um, Joan Cummings saying the Buddhist Gallery will open January 21st. So that's great news. Thank you, Joan, very timely. Um, and we look forward to that. And hopefully, um, Susan, your design for those galleries will be adhered to and we'll get to see this per piece in person. Thank you. Uh, my next question is to return to Kawase Sensei. And um, obviously you are already well known as the master of Celadon or in Japan, I've heard you refer to as Seiji Sensei. Uh, your entry into the world of color uh, broke open a whole new artistic avenue of expression and exploration that has led to even more appreciation and demand worldwide. And I have to add that his show that we currently have, which shows his full panoply of coloration in Celadon, um, sold out within 48 hours of opening. Uh, the passion and almost everyone who bought a piece already had pieces. Everyone was desperate. And I had to restrict everyone to no more than two pieces because it all would have been gone instantaneously instead of over a few days. So Sensei, how did you come to first attempt to make Celadon in a bold new color? And why did you choose red? <clears throat> えっと、僕は最初初の年とか今まで<笑> 赤い焼き物を作れと作ってくださいと依頼してきました。え、私は当初、これ青いの目指しているのに、なんで赤いものを依頼するのか、ちょっとあの、怒りました。悲劇、あの、悲劇しました。え、でも依頼主は、あの、
この与え焼き物を作ることにトライしましたでそのトライしたあのあの仕事のおかげでその次にあの水字から各字あ乱字各字とあの展開していきましたこれがあの乱字です And the, this photo is Indigo Blues. Pirate. No. Japanese say Kakuji. Kakuji. Inji de wa nai desu ne. Ah, kore mada inji. Kore Kakuji desu. Kakuji. So you see the range of color, and if those of you who check out my website who live far away, you will see an extraordinary array of color. But I want to show you、uh, my birthday present that Checo so wisely commissioned Kawase Sensei to make, which is this、uh, flower bud, which starts to have. A burgundy undercoating in a striation pattern. And it was, it's a test piece. It was his first piece. So he left the pad for when it was fired for rather than take it off and sand it to make it a perfect piece. The whole idea is to leave it as a present, as a test piece. And the other thing I should say, some of you may not know that in the Asian tradition, when you turn 60, what's called the Kanareki. You are reborn in your next 60 year cycle. So you are a baby once again. So red is the preferred color for a choice of 60th birthday presents. And you actually are supposed to wear red clothing, wear a red vest、uh, as you are reborn into your next cycle. So this was the gauntlet that Chieko placed in front of Kawase. And as he said, he was a bit annoyed by it. Uh, but in the end, he's had、uh, seven years of incredible success resulting from that. So it was okay.、Um, uh, Susan, may I turn the next question to you, our second to last question?、Uh, as a passionate, I would say, obsessed collector, collector of works of Kawase Shinobu, can you tell us about what you're a professional? What appeals to you personally? And how do you select one piece from the next? And with your knowledge and expertise in Chinese and Japanese fine art, and particularly Celadon, what do you see in the work of Kawase Shinobu that is particularly noteworthy and even unique for you? Well, I think、um, I, sh I should say from the very beginning that when I collect, I don't use any of the academic knowledge I have learned or curatorial knowledge, and I just I collect things I fall in love with. It's all emotional for me.、Um, I, had, I saw that the red、um, T bolt was in the PowerPoint, but I made them add the second one of the PowerPoint of the red T bolt so you could see the inside of it. Um, one of the things, you know, you asked me what attracts me as a collector, and there are a number of things. And one thing, of course, is the color of the glaze. And as you and, and Sensei know, I am completely addicted to his works. And I thought that I had seen so many different varieties, different shades of blues,、um, different shades of grayish green and pale blue. Uh, Kingfisher Celadon glaze, lychee inspired Celadon glaze. When I saw the red,、um, I just completely、uh, flipped out. But also, think about you know, when you're talking about tea bowls, think about what the color of the tea is contrasting with the color of the bowl. Think about when you drunk the tea, what do you see in the bottom of the bowl? When after you drink your tea out of this bowl, You see this wonderful color, unexpected color, and a pattern. And it's, it's a little hard to see on this screen, but the silver pattern reminded me of a Shosuin textile, like a Tang Dynasty textile with silver threads in it or something.、Um, so there's like this magical surprise that you see at the bottom of the bowl. And I really want to tell Sensei that I know he's. Talking about not doing more colors, you have to keep doing colors. They're just too fabulous and too addictive. 
Uh, another thing about color is thinking about the color of the clay in the bowl. Was the, was the base clay very white? Was it dark clay? And how does that impact on the color of what you see? The colors are surprising. They're very luscious. They're very elegant. The, another thing that I look at is form, the sense of motion and fluidity in his work. Um, the very organic flowing forms like a melon or a persimmon. Can you show the next slide, please? This one reminds me of a, a, of a persimmon um, in terms of shape. Um, and you can see just the sensuality of the shapes and you need to touch these and hold them and touch the glaze. And if it's a, a, a tea bowl, um, feel the inner pool of the glaze at the inside base of it. And I, um, I, can't, I can't see myself on camera here, but I, um, can you see this if I hold this up? Okay, this is one that I have on my desk with this little top. So if anybody knows me and they see me sort of playing with something while I'm on a boring Zoom or something, I'm oftentimes playing with this, but you can see the back of it, the sides of it, it's a very organic shape. You have to hold the ceramics. So looking at them on screen is lovely, but you need to hold them. And um, that's one thing that really, really um, makes me fall in love with them even more. Um, next slide, please. And um, out of all the works I own by Kawase Sensei, um, this is my absolute favorite. Um, it, he did this in 2003, which shows you just how long I've been obsessed with his work. Um, and when I saw a Celadon calligraphy set, I just, you know, obviously had to have it. Um, and you can see the inkstone, uh, the water dropper, the brush rest. Um, it came with a bamboo brush. Um, and it also came with this tiny little copper ladle to use in, in, the, uh, in the water dropper so that you could add the water to the ink. And um, I, love, I love the tea bowls, I love flower vases, I love them all, but there's just something, and probably just because I'm such a Chinese painting geek, um, an ink painting geek, uh, there's something about this set that is just completely magical to me. Um, so I'm not sure if I've given you a very academic analysis of collecting, but I don't collect in an academic way. Uh, and I think you just have to fall in love with the pieces, fall in love with the color, with the shape. And his works are so elegant. And you can see that the glaze kind of glows. They kind of glow from within with this, you know, internal light source. So they're very magical. And obviously I'm very addicted, but there you go. Well, uh, thank you, Susan. Uh, from one addict to another, um, as I said before, what set me on this course with contemporary clay was exactly an inkstone. Uh, and I d I'm not fortunate enough to own a whole set like this, but I do have an inkstone. It took me another two decades for him to make one for me uh, because I coveted Madame Kikuchi so desperately. So uh, we are on the same page completely. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I would like to ask my final question before we open the, the floor for um, questions from our audience for uh, Sensei, our last question. Uh, check on just a second. So the last question is, uh, many in our audience have been admiring on our website, those who haven't come to the gallery, your brand new, what you call NG glaze, or lychee blush inspired celadon. And these are presented in our current exhibition. Um, this is known to be the most difficult effect which she's to your very difficult firing process. Okay, so can you explain to our audience the various steps that uh, you take in order to create this NG glaze and what are the pitfalls? What could possibly go wrong so that we can understand exactly how difficult this particular glaze type is? Um, あの、僕のあの、あの稽古の、あの、
持ってきてください。それはあの容器費が愛した愛知です。で、あの今まであの日本に来てたのは台湾産の真っ赤なライチなんですが、この写真のようにあの中国雲南産のライチはあの赤緑の中に赤がポッと刺してるとても綺麗な色でした。でそのとても綺麗な色なのでそれとあの僕のテストピースの中にあのこのたまたま緑と赤が刺しているものがありましたでそれをあの少し研究してこの,あのエンジという釉薬が完成しましたでただこのエンジの釉薬はとてもあの釜の中のコントロールが大変難しく同じようなものを2つあの複数作ることはなかなか難しくあのすごく大変なあの釉薬ですで、ね。とても釉薬が難しいのですごくこの<笑>難しいと余計あの釉薬研究にあの没頭してしまいあのもっともっときれいな色とかあのそういうものを求めるようになりました。特にあのマービスさんからもっときれいなものもっと赤いものとかご依頼,ご依頼いただいてますますこの世界に入ってしまいましたでふと気がつくとあの僕は焼き物をあの形であの表現あの追求するってことが根本なんですけどもその根本であるあの形を作ることがどうしてもあの色のことに気になってあのおろそかになっていることに気がつきましたでそこでここはあの一旦いあの色の世界から一休みしてまたあの静かなあの純粋な青に今再ト,あのトライしています。Uh, this, this recent piece by Sensei is actually quite sizable. You can't tell from the slide because the, the incense burner you saw before is two inches by three inches, and this is more like 12 inches. And actually, when you encounter this brand new piece, it, it feels like it's breathing. There is such life in this piece, the vessel that it feels like it's expanding and contracting, and the cover on it is extraordinarily elegant. And the way it rises from a very diminutive foot is very beautiful. But I have to say, I hope、uh, Susan's plea and others' plea to not abandon color forever,、um, <laughs> we might be able to entice him back to the world of color in the future. Thank you very much,、uh, Kwase Sensei. I have to say, your NG bowls, as you said, every single one was different. And, People were enamored of them, and those were the first things to go.、Uh, they, they, if they could fly out the door, they flew out the door. So, that、uh, is the main part of our presentation. We have a, just a couple questions.、Um, and one of the, the more interesting questions, I think, is for Bob、um, that one of our viewers asked、uh, Do the locations of identically prepared stonewares within the kiln? In the same firing, regardless of reduction or non reduction firing, and regardless of celadon or dingwei or other types of wear, such as in a dragon kiln, make a difference in the coloration of the individual pieces,、um, such as the ones located in the center of a kiln or on the periphery, or I would add higher up or lower down or closer to the firebox or whatever. In other words, how does location within in the kiln itself? Change the appearance of the final product?、Uh, yes, <clears throat> excuse me.、Uh, the location of the pieces within the kiln can have a very big influence on the way they turn out. Um, uh, one has to remember that in a traditional kiln in China, things are very different today with electric kilns, with gas fired kilns, with thermometers, with thermostats.、Uh, <clears throat> it would be very difficult to produce the type of ceramics that. Kawase Sensei、uh, produces in traditional kilns. Uh, uh, but in traditional kilns, yes, the location within the kiln,、uh, the firing chamber, uh, uh, has a great influence on the, the appearance of the piece. Keep in mind that in traditional kilns in China, and this would have been true traditional kilns、uh, in Korea, Japan,、uh, Southeast Asia, any place producing high fired wares. 
the efficiency rate, which is to say the rate of failure, uh, is around 50 to 60 percent. Uh, you put many pieces, you might put a thousand pieces into a kiln, 500, it depends on the size of the kiln. Uh, of course, the pieces, if they're to be finely finished pieces, like the, the ones I showed, the uh, the uh, dingware, the juneware with those beautifully finished gl uh, glazes, each piece goes into a separate firing box called a sagger. It looks more or less like a, a modern hat box, a cylindrical container with a cover. Uh, the saggers can be shaped uh, different shapes, but it, the, uh, the saggers do three things. One, they protect the pieces being fired from soot, ash, and other combustion products going through the firing chamber uh, with the draft of the kiln. Number two, as you put more wood on the fire or more coal uh, into the fire, there will suddenly be an increase in temperature. As that burns down, the temperature goes down a little bit, not wildly, but it's just to say there are fluctuations in temperature. The, uh, and those fluctuations in temperature can be deleterious to the ceramics being fired, causing them to warp if the uh, fluctuation is too much uh, to, uh, to slump and such. So the thick walls of the sagger protect the uh, pieces being fired from those fluctuations in temperature. And number three, a really important thing for kiln efficiency is that the saggers can be stacked, meaning that you can have a whole column depending on the height of the kiln, a whole column of ceramics uh, and columns side by side by side. Uh, <clears throat> now, uh, in the heat of the kiln, remember you're going from on a nice day, maybe 70 or 80 degrees outdoors, that is Fahrenheit. And when you, uh, the firing temperature of high fired pieces is going to be in the range of 1200, 1300 degrees centigrade. A huge increase in temperature. And it means that things expand a great deal. So that sometimes an entire column of uh, saggers will fall over. Uh, that kind of, this is why there's so much loss uh, in traditional kilns. Uh, but uh, all kinds of things happen. There are different, there are areas that are known to be, uh, and of course it's based on trial and error. There's no other way. It's not just that this part of the kiln gives the best results, that part of the kiln gives the worst results. <clears throat> it's based on the individual kiln, um, and the way the draft from the fire flows through the kiln uh, and the way it circulates, the way it flows through, carries the temperature, carries the, uh, the carbon monoxide and other, uh, other gases. And so with each kiln, it's based on trial and error of getting to know the kiln, how it operates and where the best results are achieved. Keep in mind that uh, these kilns have to be you have to build new kilns every 30 years or so. It's not that the same kiln can last hundreds of years. Uh, in the same way that the saggers and the ceramics are expiring, so are the bricks of which the kiln is made. And they can only take uh, so much repeated expansion contraction under such high temperatures so that the kilns begin to disintegrate, depending on how long they're used. Of course, if it's used once a year, it can probably be used many, many more years. But in a traditional kiln, in traditional times, if you're firing, uh, three, four, five times a year to high temperatures, the kiln really won't last very long, about 30 years or so, but not much more than that. This is why when I say each kiln, they have to a trial and error of finding out what is the personality, if you will, of this kiln. Uh, uh, how does it want to be treated? Uh, what, how do we treat it so that it will give the best results? And what's the location for those best results? Thank you, Bob, that was insightful. I have a, an auxiliary question for you because in the, the system of communal kilns uh, pre-1960, particularly in the ceramic centers where uh, ceramic making villages would all bring their works to a community kiln and they were assigned certain shelves in certain locations and the grandson would have the same shelf and the great grandson would have a certain shelf and depending on your stature as to which shelf you got. Um, did the Chinese do the same thing so that you were sort of stuck in a village of ceramic making and that's where you have to fire from? Um, there's so many different types of kilns in China, it's difficult to say, but the big kilns, the ones in Jinjian that produced the blue and white ware, uh, the kilns that produced Ding ware, the kilns that produced Yaojia ware, things like that, uh, they weren't, they of course, they were villages of potters, but they weren't potters working individually. These were great manufactories. Uh, the the uh, goal, of course, was a luxury product, or at least a very high quality product. But the bottom line was a profit. 
uh, and so they had to figure out, this is why stacking the kiln and being able to stack uh, the saggers uh, for maximum efficiency of, in the use of the fuel uh, was so important to them. Uh, so it wasn't one potter making a pot. It was, a whole, it was a, uh, an assembly line production with a very high degree of specialization on the individual potters and <clears throat> a very high uh, degree of division of labor. So that in a big kiln such as Jing De Zhang, uh, it is written in Ming uh, records that a pot might have passed through the hands of 150 different people during the course of its manufacture. So there's nothing about grandson, this and that. It's, uh, it is a factory uh, with everyone. Uh, his, uh, basically all was men uh, in China, uh, everyone uh, doing his job uh, and not another job. So some, some people who had no artistic talent would be preparing the clays of uh, purifying it <clears throat> uh, and such. Others would be shaped the pieces on a potter's wheel. Uh, others then would cut the foot ring after the basic bowl had been shaped. Uh, in terms of decoration, there was, a, there was the master decorator who would paint the, the decoration, whether it's a, a, a lotus scroll, whether it's a landscape, whether it's figures, whatever. Then you would have someone else who did a particular type of border. You would have someone else whose only talent was to draw the so-called bowstring line, the little border line at the top and the little border line at the bottom. Someone else in charge of drawing the ceramics, someone else in charge of applying the glaze. Then there was a whole crew of people who were in charge of firing kilns and such. And so, uh, it was based on what the best <clears throat> uh, uh, the best outcome for the kiln was. If they're producing things for the palace, that is, it's an imperial kiln, uh, they're probably going to produce things in that firing that are not imperial. The things that for this particular kiln that they know they've experimented with, they know the best positions, the pieces that truly are destined for the palace will go in those areas, but they have to fill up the rest of the kiln. And so they're probably producing non-imperial wares in the same kiln, high quality wares because they're high quality potters and they will sell for a high price, but not to the palace. But those pieces will go to other parts of the kiln. And so it's more by intended clientele than it is by potter. Thank you. It's sort of how it works in, in factory produ production, like in Kakimon and the areas that are doing more Chinese related material. Uh, um, yes, I'm sure it's the same. Yeah. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. Um, so this is a question that was passed to me for Kawase Sensei. Uh, you now have this large range that you're threatening all of us, you're going to stop doing all these different kinds of glazes. So when you were producing color from 19, 2014 to today, how did you decide which type of glaze goes on which type of piece in terms of shape and versus surface? あの、私の場合はまずあの作りたいあの形が決まります。で、その形をより what I decide first, I make a form, shape. And after that, for this pieces, which color is good? Which color is the best matches? で, そして, あの, シャープさやスピード感、動きを、感を表現したい場合は、粘土に白い土を使ってます。で、あの、暖かさや柔らかさを表現する場合は、黒い粘土を使います。で、もっとその、あの、力強さとか。あの、重厚感を表現する場合は黒い粘土で、あの、貫入が入るような組み合わせ、組み合わせをしております。So, I want to show the make a sharp piece or feeling its movement. Then I use the white clay. And the warm on the soft that's case i want to show that show in the piece 
I use dark black frame and uh, very powerful pins and very, how to say, uh, weight. It has a weight, something weight. Then that case, I use black clay and crackled. That is my way how to make it. Anyway, so first to make, how to make the shape first. Thank you. Um, the range of form and the range of color is extraordinary. And um, we see Kawase Sensei's work in museums across the globe. And they look, as you could see in Susan's presentation, exquisite, nestled amongst uh, in treasures of antiquity, as well as uh, adjacent to modern other Celadon artists, such as uh, Fukami Sueharu in the Infinite Blue Show. So I must thank all of you for being with us today and for the enlightening groundwork that we all need to know about Celadon. I don't know about you guys, but I get asked this question all the time. What color is Celadon? And how do you, what is Celadon? So I think um, we've explained that really well to a lot of people. And um, we are very much going to, we're recording this session. It'll be available on our website in the next couple of days. And the next time somebody asks me this question yet again, I am just going to send him, them to this wonderful video presentation. Our, our show for Kawase's uh, Masterworks current show will be up through the middle of December. Our next panel, um, I am hosting for Asia Week, which will be about collecting contemporary Asian art with four of Asia Week's participants. Our topics will not be clay. They will be bamboo art, uh, Pan-Asian contemporary photography, uh, Chinese ink art, and um, I'm missing something. Um, uh, but we have four, uh, we have uh, Christie's participants, uh, Sotheby's participants, I should say, uh, Miyako Yoshinaga for photography, Thai gallery for bamboo art, and um, then ink art from the ink studio. And each of the experts will be paired with a very prominent and philanthropic collectors in that field and uh, one or two uh, curators as well. And that'll be on December 2nd. And our, our next exhibition will be thankfully back at the winter show. This will be my 41st year in the fair and we're doing an exhibition um, on Kyoto both clay art um, as well as uh, the painting arts of the 18th and 19th century. Uh, and not posted here in March, Asia Week 2022, which hopefully people will be back in New York. I have seen many old friends and faces coming through in the last couple of weeks. New York is beginning to feel a bit like normal. Theaters are open, restaurants are open, uh, museums are open, and people are coming back and staying in hotels. So we're hoping Asia Week will be back to its normal robust self next March. And our exhibition will be uh, the Jim. modern work by Kondo Takahiro, um, a series called Making Waves. So thank you all for staying with us tonight. It's been a pleasure to bring all these old friends back together again on a common passion. And I hope you all have a wonderful Thanksgiving holiday and stay safe and um, rejoin us again next month. Thank you very much.